right, before I go on, my name is Emmanuel Muturia. I'm from Strathmore University, Kenya. Shout out to all the Kenyans out there. And I'm also a campus director from my campus. So again, shout out to all the directors out there who might be in the meeting. So, like I said, we have brought you the best of the best speakers. And today we are joined with Steve Fox. And Steve is an international business leader experienced in climate, education, and social enterprise. And for the past five years, he was the CEO of Impact Global Education, whereby he managed to he managed for brands in the international development space as well as the education space. And with offices in the 13 countries around the world, they managed to deliver impactful programming in social entrepreneurship, their peers, and volunteering in the refugee health and education spaces. Steve comes from an international development and investment background, previously serving as the CEO of Think Impact and the managing director of Sunny Zoro. I hope I haven't butchered that investments in the sub-Saharan Africa. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest today, Steven. The floor is yours. Oh, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Loud and clear. Well, uh, thank you, Emmanuel, for having me. Wonderful to see you all. You're leaving off the most important accolade that I have, which was I was one of the early MCN interns, or almost original class of MCN interns back in the day uh, when uh, when Sam Vagar was uh, was a student leader himself. Uh, so. Um, I have deep affinity for the for Millennium Campus Network, um, uh, and I want to start by congratulating all of you uh, on your selection of becoming Millennium Fellows. Uh, this is incredible. Uh, I got the statistics statistics right before this on how uh, uh, I don't want to use the word exclusive, but how impressive it is to become a uh, Millennium Fellow and. Congratulations. What an accomplishment. I'm so proud of each and every one of you. Um, all right. So uh, I think the theme of today uh, was um, to kind of hit on social enterprise, what it is to be a work in the social enterprise space, be um, a leader in the social enterprise space. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. I um uh, kind of uh, have worked in both the climate change and social change um, spaces um, uh, and currently working in a climate change space on a, a new venture, which is a hundred million dollar um, uh, climate change fund investing in early stage companies that are working on ocean climate um, solutions. Um, and uh, it just so happens uh Uncoincidentally, that I also uh, uh, represent the Remmer Family Foundation, who's a sponsor of the MCN's Millennium Oceans Prize. Um, so I'm definitely a weird ocean guy. If you have questions about climate change and oceans, I'm standing by for those. Uh, but previous to that, um, as Emmanuel mentioned, um, I had done uh, much of my uh, work in um social change around the education space um, uh, along a number of themes. Uh, I ran a international um, education organization that worked on social entrepreneurship and environmental entrepreneurship, in large part in rural parts of um, the global South. Um, uh, and this was working to uh, um, propel um, social entrepreneurs, nonprofit and for-profit leaders alike um, to, uh, to take their ideas um, and, and turn them into action um, and in very much a supporting role. Um, so I can, I'm also here happy to speak to uh, my experience with that. Um, and then I, I wear the final hat of being a grant maker um, and um, and working across international philanthropy at times. Um, uh, I'm a trustee with the Rimmer Family Foundation, um, and I sit on the board of a group called the Network of Engaged International Donors. Um, and uh, um, I'm really uh, happy um, to support uh, incredible change makers in both social and environmental space through through that um, avenue as well. Um, so I'm I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, I want to thank the uh, MCN, the United Nations Academic Impact, for launching the Millennium Fellowship. And again, congratulate all of you on um, 
your commitment to lead with empathy, humility, and inclusion. Um, all right. Uh, let's kick it off. I'm happy to speak more to my experiences and, and what I think defines this, but, uh, but I'll, I'll turn it back over for questions. Right, sorry about that. Now, guys, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you for taking our time to attend this session. And now before we move on to the next section, let me just mention how the session is kind of structured. And it is sort of, it's divided into two, whereby I'll start with the Q&A from me with the, uh, with the speaker, whereby the next session, the section, sorry, will be the question and answers based on your questions. So. Without further ado, once again, let me begin the questions. And Stephen, thank you once again for you know introducing yourself, what you stand for, and it's a pleasure to have you once again. And now, speaking of the works that you have been able to engage with and such, what steps did you take as an undergrad to position yourself in a position rather, you know, to have such an incredible career at a young age? Since I'm sure majority, if not all of us, are young and would like to have you know your thoughts on this. So what steps did you take as an undergrad to, you know, to kickstart your career at such a young age? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think um, there, there are uh, ultimately two, two things that have uh, had in my undergraduate experience that really allowed me to j jump into the uh, early part of my career. Um, uh, and in particular, to work on um, work across countries on issues on issues related to climate and social uh, social change that were really important. So the first was uh, kind of just sticking my neck out and making myself uncomfortable and do it and and jumping into um, travel and volunteer myself. Um, I think uh, I uh, it wasn't in the realm of my comfort zone necessarily to um to go out and uh and reach out to new folks about the work that they were doing uh and to ask if i could be of assistance but that was a guiding principle for me uh as an undergraduate in that i knew that i wanted to work on issues of social change uh at the time and environmental change and i um and and so i would volunteer myself um to organizations um, all over the place, um, and sometimes over committing myself slightly, uh, but with the expectation to push myself beyond my comfort zone. Um, Sam, Sam Bagar and I have a, uh, a recently uh, departed a dear friend, a guy named Jerry Hildebrand, who had a great quote that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Um, and uh, and I really, even before knowing Jerry, I think uh, I, I think back on that, and and that was a, an important way to push myself. Um, so on a macro level, it was that really tactically, um, I, uh, I also, um, am not, a, not a good writer at all. I'm, a, I'm actually kind of a terrible writer. Um, but I wrote and I wrote and I wrote about the experiences and the issues that I was seeing. And I kind of just passed them around to other people who were good writers and collaborated with them. Um, I think one of the things that is really important, um, uh, especially at the Asian time uh, in your careers that you're each facing, is that you have a zeal and a passion for issues that can come across in storytelling that doesn't have the um, the weathered uh, component of experience that sometimes uh, dilutes the story that you're trying to tell. Um, uh, you get straight to the issues, get straight to the passionate pieces. Um, and I see that constantly in MCN fellows. Um, and so I would encourage you, no matter if you're a terrible writer like myself, or if you're a, uh, or if you thrive in the occupation to write about your experiences and not be afraid to share them. Um, the other part that's important is to, again, push yourself beyond your comfort zone and share your thoughts and opinions. Um, there are times when you're going to push them out there and people will be combative with you or will disagree, but use that as an opportunity, um, both to improve, uh, and, and hone your arguments and the opinions that you're making. Um, but also to engage with new folks who, um, will become thought partners for you later. Again, terrible writer, uh, but still, um, think it was an important part of my experience.
right i can see sam has said that you're a great writer which i tend to believe you're also a great writer i don't know why you are kind of <laughs> but that's subject to debate now you've talked quite well about you know the steps you took as an undergrad and i think everybody over here has quite benefited from that and which leads me to the next question you've mentioned that you have worked in the private sector for years and you've been involved in the social impact through your family foundation so i'm curious what do you what do you think the role of the private sector should be in advancing the sdgs since as you know majority of us our projects actually all of us the mcn projects will deal with the sdgs so would you tell us please what your role what do you think the role of our private sector should be in such a setup yeah Absolutely. I'm going to age myself because they used to be the MDGs back when I first engaged with uh, William Campus Network. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I've been really happy to see them evolve into the SDGs. Um, the private sector, uh, I, I've spent my entire career working in the private sector towards issues around SDGs. Um, my hypothesis on this is that um, the both the social issues and climate change, which is where I'm currently dedicate my time, are what I would call a Sisyphusian journey. Um, uh, I can see a bunch of you. Raise your hand if you know who Sisyphus is. Pop quiz. You're all students. Come on. Okay. So if you don't know who Sisyphus is, Sisyphus uh, in Greek mythology uh, lived in the underworld and was imprisoned, and his task every day was to push this rock up a hill. Um, and then the rock would roll all the way back down and he would have to go do it again. These issues are, whether it be climate change, whether it be international migration, are Sisyphusian issues. There are many, and the difference being there are many Sisyphuses. We're all pushing little rocks up the hill or watching them roll back down as we run into challenge and challenge and challenge. Um, I think of those different folks, you need an, a, a solid balance of folks working in the private sector, in the public sector, and in the non-for-profit sector to take on each of these uh, these particular issues. Without that balance, um, you often see weights of power um, and the representation of of um, of the folks working on the issues fall out of balance. Um, and for me, the private sector has been the the method by which to pursue this type of work for me on the on two two bases. One is I was always an entrepreneur. When I was young, uh, even in school, I was uh, buying candy and reselling it to my classmates. Uh, I was I I literally. Uh, was about, again going to date myself back when there was this uh, eBay. I would I had an early account on eBay, which was this online auction uh, company, and I would find ways to uh, sell things on eBay. Um, I um, uh, um, and so uh, that entrepreneurial leaning led me to find ways to sniff out uh, opportunities to make revenue. Um, and so it became a natural, a natural path for me when I knew that I could sniff out revenue to pursue the private sector as the means by which um, uh, I take on social and environmental change. The key for me, though, I, and this is a learning experience over the course of my career, is that it's much harder to adapt social and environmental change into private sector work than it is to start by uh, establishing the work that you're doing as related to social environmental change. And I've been on both sides of the coin uh, to uh, success, uh, I guess some success on either side. I would encourage you, if you're gonna work in the private sector, to establish as quickly as you can in any organization, whether it be your own or one that you're working for, your dedication to social and environmental change. It resonates with people. Even if they disagree with the issues that you're speaking about, if you come in and you mention that this is the thing that I'm passionate about, you'll be known as that person. Um, and being known as that person allows people to come to you when issues around that arise, um, at a minimum to get your opinion on things. Um, the private sector has been a phenomenal tool for me to uh, to take on these issues, to find revenue streams, to support um, some of these things, and to and to uh, be constantly cognizant of how the private sector can be warped to to not serve the purposes of social enterprise, and to look out for those examples. Um, 
I, I encourage those, again, certainly those of you of entrepreneurial leanings to pursue uh, some sort of experience in the private sector, but to also test the public sector and the non-for-profit sector. I think only without the balance of understanding each of the Sisyphusian journeys will you understand exactly which is the right fit. Great question. Right. I've especially loved that part where you said used to buy and resell candy. And that's funny because that's the same thing most of us used to do back in high school. You know, used to buy things from the shop and you go and resell at a at a good price. Yeah. So having said that, let's take an example. Um, there's an undergrad student probably in this meeting, this session, and they have a passion project, whether it's on their side or it's the one based on their MCN, and they would love or they would wish to have funding. And I've seen this even in the chat, a lot of people are asking questions about funding. So as a young philanthropist, what advice would you give to the undergrad students who are trying to you know, implement their passion projects and hope to potentially seek some sort of funding or rather support in the coming months to help them actualize their visions? It's a good question. Um, uh, really good question. So I'll speak to uh, grant funding uh, briefly, and then I can also speak to private capital investment funding, because I think that that will be both are useful tools. The, the, the two things that I would encourage you to think about is Often when you want to pursue a project, and I've been I've been both on the grant making and investment side and also very much on the seeking grant money and on uh, seeking investment money side. I've spent equal, uh, actually equal amounts of my career on both sides. Um, I, I would tell you that there's three components that are really crucial um, to getting your work together. First is dedicate yourself to becoming an expert. In the thing that you're speaking about, um, that the the number one way that uh, you can um, that you that you can flesh out your issue, flesh out the thing that you're looking funding for, and the way that usually costs no money um, is to spend your time becoming an expert. Um, read all that you can, um, f figure it out, debate people uh, online in these MCN meetings uh, at your university. Devote yourself to trying to become an expert. Simultaneously, learn to tell your story. What is the issue that you're working on? And why are you different than other folks that are working on it? Um, what makes you, uh, as the individual, um, what, what makes the issue that you're working on urgent to you at this time? Uh, what makes you especially unique in taking it on, and why is it important writ large? Always, always important to hit on those three things: urgency, why you, and why is it important. Um, and tell a story around that. Really important. The third thing is just keep doing the work. Yeah, if you don't have, it, oftentimes we stop ourselves from diving into taking on these taking on these issues because we're like we can't do it without funding. That's a chicken and the egg problem. If we 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 have the egg or we have the chicken, we don't have both. Um, I I would say there if you're scrappy and you can figure out a way to keep on trying to figure out how to work towards your problem without resources, that shows the wherewithal to funders that you will be a good custodian of their money. Um, and to this end, I'll speak specifically to the difference between grant making and investment capital, um, social investment or impact investment capital specifically here. Um, if you're pursuing grant grant funding, uh, my advice to you is to first plan on building a relationship with your grant with potential grant funders. Um, recognize that grant funding is is uh, and I would encourage you the same thing on the private side, but I would encourage different types of styling the relationship. On the grant funding side, I would ask questions about before you ask for money about why, what they are hoping to achieve. And crucially, things like what are their pain points? Um, something that grant makers never hear is like, what's bothering you? 
what, what, what are the things you're trying to solve? Um, and by helping to figure out what they're trying to solve, you figure out very quickly if you're a natural fit or even if you can evolve into a natural fit or you can find common ground in what you're looking for. Um, recognize that there's another human on the other side of this and not just somebody who's trying to uh, push money out into the world. Um, on the investment side of things, um, it's much of the same issue. Uh, they they often have something they're looking for, but they're often investing in uh, um, on the impact side. They're investing, uh, same as in the grant making, they're investing in the individual and in the belief that the individual will uh, make a return for them over time on the basis of social and environmental issues and on the basis of profit. Um, and so if you're able to hit on those first two points of uh, doing the work and to continuing to tell your story um, uh, uh, you can, and, uh, and making yourself an expert, also just continue to invest in uh, as crucially as the can, the why you component of it. Um, but again, to, to figure out what are their pain points. It's by far the most common thing that I see in young young folks is they can tell an incredibly compelling story of why this issue is important, why it's urgent, why now, and then they never go to the grant maker and say, but why you? Uh, so don't leave that fourth question out. Right, amazing points over there. And now for my final question, and I think I've even seen one of our members has typed it, Krishnan, if I'm not wrong. And the question is, as a philanthropist, again, what mistake did you or do you see young founders making with their organizations and their projects that you'd advise us not to make? And I think I'll journey to the question that I've seen in the chat again from, from Krishnan, which is, you're a social entrepreneur. So the word social obviously means that you're interacting with people. And as you know, you know, everybody has their own approaches, their own flaws and all that. So let me divide the question into two rather. What's the mistake that you see young founders making with these sort of organizations and projects? And also when it comes to the problem of, you know, social interactions, what are the challenges that you faced and how did you navigate them? Two questions, right, Emmanuel? First question is basically, what is the common problem that you see people making uh, or common problems that you see people making? The second one is basically, how do you navigate them? Absolutely. Right, sweet. Okay, good questions. You're on a roll, man. Um, all right, so for, first, uh, <laughs> the first one that I see everybody making, a uh, common problem, is you're trying to boil the ocean. Uh, yeah, and I, I said in the beginning, I'm an ocean guy, so I don't like people boiling the ocean. Uh, and what I mean by that is that you're trying to accomplish too much. Your The scope of your work is far too much. Um, think about there's there's a couple of frameworks you can use, but one that I that I like a lot recently is a frame, framework called MSPOT. Uh, and MSPOT is M-S-P-O-T. It's a really good framework about thinking about the project that you're taking on. It's the, the acronym stands for five things. The first is, M, the M is for mission. What is the big picture vision? What are you trying to achieve writ large? Look at your project, evaluate it on the basis of mission. If you can't define that, probably not worth going anywhere with it from the beginning. The second is strategy. What's the strategy that you're going to take to achieve this mission? How are you going to how are you going to play it out? Doesn't matter what kind of project it is, if you don't have a strategy, if you can't illustrate how you're going to take on this thing, again, the pro you, you should probably reevaluate where you are in the project. The third is plays. What are the what are the plays? How are you what are the elements of that strategy that you're going to use to accomplish what you are? And, and crucially here, this is where the rubber hits the road on boiling the ocean. Don't try to do too many plays. You, you, you're doing your schoolwork. You've got your family. You got your friends. Whoever it is, don't try to do too much. Limit the amount of plays that you're doing, and think about what's achievable uh, in those plays. This is my favorite, which is the O: omissions. What are the things that you are choosing to omit in as a result of your strategy? Again, if you're boiling the ocean, let's say you're taking on. All right, young young Steve. I'll give you an example. Young Stephen uh, was working with a actually um, a school in Tanzania um, to help them on a project around a wash project, water and sanitation uh, 
project. Um, I went when I was young with my mom to visit this, uh, some friends of hers. We ended up at this school. The principal of the school is a super charismatic guy who made me, fe- made me feel like I was just like the bee's knees. I went back, raised a bunch of money with Patrick, the principal together. Uh, we tried to take on a big sanitation project. Um, I tried to do too much in the course of the strategy working with him. It was like, okay, let's do, every, let's do we'll recreate every single bathroom in all across all of this public school district. Um, we'll raise the money to do that. That's crazy. Don't do that. Uh, stop. Think about what you can omit in the strategy. Maybe it's like, okay, in the course of the strategy, we should be focusing on hand washing stations, or we should be focusing on, uh, on, um, clean access facilities for uh, young women going through menstruation. Uh, what it, What's in the course of your strategy? What are things you should omit? Um, and then the last one is targets, M-S-P-O-T, the T being targets. How do you sell, hold yourself accountable to the goals that you're setting? If, you can, if you're not able to hold yourself accountable in a really honest way, um, then often it's a mistake I see people taking is that they'll put these things out in the ocean and then they won't stop to say, did I achieve what I what I'm setting out to do. If I didn't achieve it, what's the thing that I should go back and start to omit or what are the plays that I should change or the strategy um, to take it on? So that's a framework I would say for the first part of your question, long answer. Um, The second part of the question is, uh, okay, how do you avoid? I mean, the answer kind of looped into both, but I would say the other thing is surround your listen to people surround yourself with smart folks who can help help you set those targets these don't and to be very clear i find young folks often are like all right i need a couple of gray beards and don't be confused by my beautiful brown hair right here i have some gray that's starting to show don't look for for gray beards exclusively look for your peers your peers will also hold you accountable um put create a board create an advisory board bring on your peers, bring on, and if you have great, great beards or you have, uh, other folks, uh, incredible, uh, mentors, uh, that you can take on, bring those folks on as well. Uh, but establish folks who will be what I would call an accountability partner to you, um, which is they're going to hold you accountable for what you're looking for. Don't only use your boards, your advisory boards, whoever you're relying on to, uh, help you raise money. Uh, those are important to bring those folks on, but but don't use them for a single purpose. Use them to hold yourself accountable. Great, great question. Long answer. My apologies. M spot. Look it up. Right. Awesome. 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 So, guys, we have come to the second and the bulkiest, I'd say, part of the session, which is the Q and A from you guys. So, whether you are using the chat, raising your hand. Please prepare your questions. Meanwhile, Stephen, if you need to take a glass of water, you can do it right now because the questions are hot. I mean hot. <laughs> now, let me begin with the first one, coming from Farah Praise. Maybe if you can unmute kindly and ask your question. That would be great. Farah Praise, if you can kindly unmute, if you are there. Right. Okay, he's not there. But let me ask the question since I can see it. Do you have any recommendations for grant opportunities for a climate action project, maybe? That's the question he was asking. Oh, good tactical question. Okay. Uh, Grant opportunities for climate. Um, Man, there are are a million grant opportunities right now, and there are more coming down the pipeline. Um, I would. Um, how should I phrase this? I would bucket your project first, which is to say, um, if you're taking on a climate action project, what kind of climate action project is it? Um, are you focused on a specific theme? Is it carbon, uh, mitigation, carbon removal? Is it, um, are you focused on, um, uh, climate action, climate justice? Uh, I would start to think about like, how are you going to bucket? What, what theme are you going to fall into? Um, and then I would start to think about uh, once you once you know that bucket and you decide define your M spot. Um, I would look at three different types of funders. Um, the 
first set of funders um, is right in your backyard is usually your un- your university within the country that you're in. There's um, there often, uh, and I'm speaking broadly, not to specific uh, specific. Um, countries, but there's often uh, a bit of funding right in your backyard. Um, uh, I would uh, ask your uh, your professors and administration about funding opportunities for your climate action projects right in your backyard there. Um, and then I would peruse um, uh, RFPs uh, that are uh, offered by your government a lot of the time. That's often, like, honestly, that's some of the uh, the lowest hanging fruit of uh of climate action funding uh, especially because there's more and more money being pumped into that right now um the second uh by accessibility uh stream of funding that i see people being able to access more and more would be your um your kind of like uh climate development finance uh which is coming from um uh Places like MCN and others, which are you're looking for prizes or competitions that are usually more open source and that you can jump into and put your name forth. Um, that's usually the second most accessible is to look out there. Um, I'd be happy to provide uh, probably not a good use of time for answering the question, but I'd be happy to provide a list of some of the folks that I think are exceptional in providing grants into climate action uh, from that kind of space. Your third and the hardest to access a uh, group of funding is gonna come from foundations. Um, and while a lot of foundations are doing incredible work to try to make themselves more accessible and to give more grants at this stage, um, they're just the hardest to get to. They have the smallest staff, uh, they have the, a process that's often not set up for making these grants, this is not all of them. Uh, but I find people sometimes reverse the order uh, and go to foundations first um, and then look in their backyard last, uh, I would encourage you to uh, go backyard first, uh, then go to international uh, develop, development, finance, climate finance flows, um, and then finally to prioritize foundations. Good question. Right, awesome recommendations, and I hope you guys have listed them down because they sound really important. I can see Nana Khadija Ibrahim has raised her hand. Maybe you can start by introducing yourself as well as asking your question. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mr. Steve. Um, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Nana Khadija. I'm from Nigeria and I'm the campus director for my school, Bayou University Canoe. Um, my question to Mr. Steve is, um, how do you really know that you've achieved social impact? Um, how, yeah, basically, how do you know that you've achieved a social impact regarding maybe a specific climate task that you've taken upon yourself? I don't know if you get my question. Let me try to repeat it back to you, Nana. Thanks for the question. Uh, so how do you know you've achieved social impact is it with or without a like quantitative statistical approach is that what, what the question was we broke up a little bit yes that's yes that's my question both with with or with and without a quantitative statistic it's a great question um uh thank you for it um and good to see um uh somebody from nigeria represented here um so i i would say that uh when you're taking on uh when you're when you're thinking about social impact in particular, and you're trying to uh, to measure the impact of the work that you're doing on, this is something that uh, funders and contemporaries partners will press you on. Um, I, my approach is uh, is not doctrine here. You should uh, certainly research your literature and figure out who who else is uh, plenty of other approaches. Um, but the way that I've traditionally done it is a is blended quantitative and qualitative um, approaches to to social impact in particular. Um, and so the first is um, uh, become friends with if you're not already somebody to this, somebody who who can do a really good survey in your school um, and make sure that you have developed on the quantitative side of social social impact, um, a survey and a methodology by which to collect results for your survey. It's the easiest, easiest way to do quantitative 
research right off the bat on social impact um, and the methodology framework that you use should really be informed by statistical method. Um, uh, it's it's don't be intimidated by it. You can take a quick online course. Uh, what's it called? Um, Khan Academy offers some great free courses on on um, surveying statistical methodology towards this. Um, uh, but you should you should uh, on the quantitative side, if you're starting from zero and there's not a clear quantitative measure of what you're doing, um, work on a survey. Um, uh, uh, and think about what are the goals of what you're trying to achieve and how you might be able to measure them in some sort of quantitative way. And then on the qualitative side, um, uh, this is where I, I tend to quantitative, I tend to look to the micro and qualitative, I tend to look to the macro, um, which is on the, uh, depending on what your sh social change mission is. Um, if you're looking to achieve it, what in the qualitative are the stories of success that you point to? And crucially, what are the stories of failure? Um, Emmanuel mentioned uh, uh, my old organization, Impact Global Education, that we used to run, that I used to run, um, and uh, which was essentially running uh, international exchange style programs and research programs around the globe. And our staff would do this awesome idea, which I'm probably going to get in trouble because it's a UN call. Uh, but we would call them fuck up Fridays, forgive my language, forgive my language. And we, and we would sit around and tell stories about, uh, uh about all the mess ups that had happened in the result of trying to achieve this social pro problem. We would record it, um, or we would write it all down and we would publish it so that everybody knew the things that we had messed up on. Um, and some of them were full on egregious, like things that you never would want to repeat again. Uh, but it was a wonderful way to hold yourselves accountable and to come to, uh, come to a, a, a meeting with your peers, knowing that everybody was, everybody was coming with something that they messed up. And granted, if you were the person who came and was like, Oh, I like misplaced this one number over here in my spreadsheet, whoopsie daisy, like come with a better mess up than that. But, uh, but, uh, some people would come with like real honest truths about what they messed up. Um, I encourage you. I know we always did it on Fridays. Um, for a while, I was trying to buy everybody ice cream so that they could uh, eat ice cream while we tossed, talked about our mess ups. Uh, but then ice cream supply was getting really hard in Thailand at the time. So we we switched it over. Um, so I would just encourage you come to it, come to a really neat place where you can share both the the real stories of success, uh, but also the areas that you messed up because those are just as important in letting you learn. Great question, Donna, thank you. Yes, I hope your question was answered. And before we move on to the next person, uh, let me just mention to you guys that in case you have any commitments and such, feel free to leave because uh, this session is being recorded. So, you, you know, you go do your thing and we'll be sure to provide the recording for you. Now for the next person, I can see Muhammad Usman was raised their hand. So kindly please ask a question. Okay. Oh yeah, now I can hear you. Hey Muhammad. Uh, my name is Muhammad Usman, uh, the campus that you have visited university here in Nigeria is a geopolitical zone of the country. Uh, I have uh, a couple of questions ask uh, regarding this very climate change. Uh, the first question is that, um, you know, uh, that uh, MSPOT is a Order to make his mission, vision, goals, and all the uh, related objectives. I'm going to type it in the chat. Yes, I think your internet is a bit off, so you can kindly type it in the chat and I'll be sure to ask it on your behalf. Right. Meanwhile, let's proceed to the next person, An Ananya. If you can please ask your question. Hi, am I audible? Uh, good evening. 
I'm Ananya from the University of Delhi, and I'm currently working on a project related to climate change and heat waves and understanding the impact on people. And I wanted to ask you that going way back to what you said, that you work for both social causes as well as climate cause causes. And while they are very interrelated, they're also very different. And people like, uh, I'm sure a lot of us over here, while working on one project, we are our, just, our head just goes to different places, like thinking how can we do more and how can we achieve more and how can we impact more people. And while I'm working towards climate change, I'm also thinking about education. I'm also thinking about sanitation. And I'm thinking, how do I just get to impact more and more people? So I wanted to ask you, what do you think is better to like be focused on one particular mission that we have in mind and complete it to fruition? Or do you think it's better to work simultaneously along, along, along a lot of projects so that it could be a well integrated or something like that? And Nadia, what a question. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, the real answer is you got to figure out what works best for you. Are you, a, are, are you able to, to, are you somebody who's going to thrive in a, uh, in a targeted focus? Or are you someone who can coordinate, is a coordinator, can take multiple pieces and make them work together? Uh, my suggestion for you at this stage in your career if you want to show results to, to other folks is to target um, uh, and focus on a specific issue um, primarily because your ability to, sh to tell the story of that for yourself um, is going to be incredibly uh, will be compelling. Um, and secondarily, because if you can achieve the one thing, it is usually the stepping stone to being able to achieve the multiple. Um, I will give you a very brief example of this, which is that uh, I was working on uh, a series of projects that were looking at sustainable agriculture. Um, and we were essentially trying to, uh, we were working in Malawi, where I lived for uh, three years, um, and um, and we we're working on um, a soybean project. Um, the idea being uh, a whole slew of farmers um, that my colleague uh, Suni was working uh, working with uh, wanted to find more profitable markets for their produce and wanted to uh, to work on it in a way that was sustain more sustainable for climate change, grown in a way that was consistent with agroecology. Um, and that was and made me nervous because it was two two missions. You were both trying to improve the the environmental soil yields, and you were also trying to create uh, more uh, a higher yield. Um, higher financial yields for the farmers that we were working with. Um, what we did was we split it, uh, which was that SUNY focused on the ecological yields and I focused on how can I make people more money um, in this particular example. And then we combine our resources and learn from each other. Um, and I went from somebody who thought that uh, soybean was uh, uh, only used to make soy sauce into somebody who actually understood all the uses of a soybean. Uh, and he went from absolutely no understanding of how you move soybeans across uh, country border lines, get fair trade certification, work on all these things to uh, being a bit of an expert in his own. has gone on to in his career to pursue these things. So I would encourage you from my own personal experience to be strategic and targeted. Uh, but I also think it totally depends on who you are as a person. Um, uh, yeah, really good question and good luck in your incredible uh, uh, endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you. You got it. Right, I can see more hands up. We have one from Nelis Koyo. If you can please unmute and ask your question, that would be nice. I can't hear you, Net Nellis. If you want to put it in the chat, though, I can answer. If you want to type it, I can uh, I can answer it there. Yes, yeah, please, yeah. Nellis. Try that one more time. Otherwise, we'll just have to type it in the chat and I can relate for you. 
Emmanuel's got a beautiful voice. I'm sure he will be really consistent with uh with the tone that you're trying to convey. <laughs> you're too kind. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to the next question. We have one from Yoal Dar. Kindly unmute and ask your question. All right, all right. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, feel free yes. to introduce yourself as well. All right, thank you so much. There are a little bit of noise, but uh, kindly try to bear with me. Uh, my name is Yaldo Mai, and uh, I'm from the University of Nairobi. And my question is around uh, climate change. Uh, when you see a lot of youth, particularly in Africa, try to resist a lot of initiatives around uh, the climate change, and that's basically because, you know, a lot of these initiatives uh, seem like foreign to them. So my question is on uh, how can we use like the indigenous knowledge, you know, to try and mitigate the climate change? Because back in the days when I was very young, you know, we are told things like, you know, don't cut down this tree, a certain tree, we believe is sacred, and if you cut it down, definitely you got cast or something like that. So how then can we try to use the very same knowledge, the indigenous knowledge, to try and address uh, issues around climate change so that whatever we are trying to advance uh, is not very important to the local or the local people. And how then can we document these stories, uh, uh, the indigenous, uh, indigenous stories for future generations to come? So that's basically my question. Thank you. That is fantastic question. Um, something that I certainly have had eyes towards for a while. Uh, thank you all. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, I'll also follow up. I'll put it in the chat. I know a great um, working group, funder group for um, in um, uh, indigenous folks working on climate change issues that I will drop into the chat. Um, but I would say, um, please, 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 uh, uh, inc I encourage you to, um, if that if that's an issue that you're working on in particular, it's one that is often unheralded but incredibly important to the to climate change issues. Uh, the two examples that I'll use is um, when I was first living in uh, Mozambique, um, uh, there's a tree called the Mpinga tree, which is uh, an African hardwood that has long been used, uh, cut down, over-exploited to make uh, clarinets and oboes, other musical instruments that are largely manufactured in the West. Um, it basically went to near extinction, extinction. On the basis of climate change on reforestation and carbon sequestration, uh, it doesn't hold particular value. There are never a ton of them out there. It's not a massive uh, climate sequester, but on the basis of biodiversity, it's a huge uh, component to ecosystems. Um, only by way of uh, the indigenous communities that I was working with in Mozambique did I understand the biodiversity angle to the tree. Uh, the scientists that I were working with like, eh, it's okay. Um, uh, but, uh, but only through... Um, Really, uh, we un we didn't do enough of the storytelling about how important it was to biodiversity into the communities that we were working in as a functional tool. Uh, to uh, did the story of the impinga tree come about? And it was a really interesting one because these impinga trees take fifty years to grow to maturity, and so the patience necessary to let impinga trees grow rather than to exploit them as quickly as possible to create musical instruments was a really interesting story to tell. Um, I think the storytelling component is massive to it, and I think. Uh, if you're able to also layer on a bit of that um, back to the measurement question, if you're Nana's question, if you're able to uh, show both the qualitative and quantitative effects of um, of that, of uh, the protection, uh, nurturing, regrowing of Mpinga trees or whichever uh, uh, indigenous, indigenous initiative that you're taking on, I highly encourage it. I'm running into the exact same thing with the protection of mangrove forests across the world in my ocean work right now, uh, which is mangroves are essential to climate change, one of the best natural instruments in climate change. And indigenous folks know better than anybody how important uh, mangroves are to the nurseries that they're working on, the biodiversity that allows them uh, uh, to create thriving habitats for a lot of the activities um, that their community is working on. Um, so I encourage you to work on the storytelling and couple it with the qualitative and quantitative. A, wonder, a wonderful question. Thank you. Yes, I hope your question was answered quite well. 
And now as you wind up, I would love to just leave an entry for three more questions. And let me begin with one that I've seen in the chat, with it, which I think can actually glue everything that you've said together, which is by Suzelle. And she's asking, what can we be doing in our everyday actions to, you know, facilitate everything you've talked about, especially on the social impact bits? Yeah, that's a great question. I would I would use opportunities like this. I mean, this one you're just listening to some weirdo talk about oceans, but I would use MCN opportunities to talk to to engage with your peers um, uh, and understand what they're working on. I so often you're going to be working in your silo. Somebody had written in the chat before, how do you, you know, what if you're the single person working on your initiative and you don't have anybody out there? This is the beauty of an organization like the MCN and like United Nations Academic Impact and that you can find like-minded peers out here. Don't be afraid to put your story out there to put what you're working on. But when you put it out there, ask for help or ask what other people are looking for. Review the chat to be like, dang, look, this person's working on something interesting that's connected. Let's work it together. I mentioned my partner, Suni and I, in our swiping project earlier. That all came from me putting myself out there to be like, I don't know jack about soybeans. Um, so, uh, but I do know something about how to uh, move a bunch of money around on a screen. Uh, so, so let's. Uh, so we teamed up and took it on. I encourage you to find partners. There's no, but you're in a community there that there's no better place to um, to look for those types of partners. Great question. Yes, thank you for that. And now let me just list the last three people who can ask their questions, and then now we can close off the session. And let me begin with Olua Yega Williams. If you can kindly unmute and introduce yourself, and then ask your question. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Williams Olua Bega from the Federal University of Agriculture, Nigeria. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hello? Oh, okay. So my question is, is conventional agriculture contributing or deteriorating the well-being of the ecosystem? And can it be an ideal measure of sustainability? Woo! Uh, I'm, no, I'm, I'm no climate scientist, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be careful in what I walk into on this one. Uh, but it depends. It, I would I say this. Ecosystem, ecosystem wellness is, uh, if we go back to the, my point about the micro and the macro, ecosystem wellness is a crucial component of the micro, of a micro indicator of overall climate health. Um, and one of the things I think you said, you're Colin, Colin from Nigeria. Uh, you'll be familiar with the expansion of the Sahel, um, uh, this kind of arid region that is uh, really uh, northern Nigeria is completely changed from an ecosystem standpoint, at least in my lifetime, um, that that's measured at the macro scale. I've been to towns in northern Nigeria that are still are thriving ecosystems held within themselves. And those are all a major component of being able to uh, prove out ecos uh, local ecosystem wellness is a major contributor to, to um, ability to combat climate change. Um, on the basis of, I think it was Ananya's question earlier, not only the environmental, but also the social, uh, which is that if your local ecosystem uh, goes completely arid, pushes people out, uh, et cetera, those folks are going to flood to an urban area most uh, most of the time and flooding to that urban area. They're going to put pressure on resources in that community, which is only going to exacerbate that local ecosystem. Uh, so, yes, local ecosystem wellness is a crucial, crucial factor. Um, great question. Uh, but also listen to climate scientists before me on that one. Listen to scientists generally before you listen to me on that one. Right, listen to scientists first before you listen to <laughs> Stephen. So let us finalize with just one more question and then we can do the rest of the... Let me begin with Michael Ekundayo. Please ask your question. You can introduce yourself first. Michael. Uh, 
Oh, thank you very much. Um, Steve, thank you. My name is Michael Kundayo from Nigeria, above from Naolawa University, precisely. Um, I really enjoy and appreciate your conversation as regards going extra, but leaving your comfort zone. Um, based on your profile, I would just like to ask about the power of your collaboration. How are you able to go about it? And how are you able to use your strategies of your quantitative and qualitative measures to hit the ball? while you're picking up your research work or your um, the deliveries as regards global impacts. And also, I would also like to ask that, why are you doing all those things? And what are the key mistakes that you try to avoid that really, really cost you a lot, that can be a guide to people that are just coming after you? It's a really good question. And I think I, I, I uh, you broke up very slightly, so uh, I'll repeat the question back so you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Essentially, it was a two-part question. The second part of the question was, how can, uh, what can you use as a guide um, to, uh, in the course of, of multiple pursuits, uh, to make sure you're not going down the wrong pathway? And then the first part of the question, I think I missed. Uh, Michael, can you kindly? Okay, just a moment. Let me unmute you before you can. Really oh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. I was talking about the power of collaboration. How are you able to navigate things as an undergraduate to where you are? Great. All right. Yeah, power of collaboration. Um, all right. Uh, another raise your hand moment. Who out here is uh, dating? Who's, who's looking for people to date? Who's out there dating people? Raise your hand. I'm not. Uh, by the way, I have two, I have two ch beautiful children and a lovely wife. The, uh, come on, are we, what's going on here? Nobody's gonna raise their hand? I don't believe you. It's supposed to be an honest group. All right, fine, 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 fine. Okay, so in the course, I'm not gonna give you dating advice here, but what I will tell you is that apply your dating, the way that you approach dating, the way you approach looking at potential partners for your future, the same way you approach your work partners, work partnerships. Think, think about how you you daydream about how you would like to spend your life with people daydream about how your working relationship with somebody could go. If you can manifest, if you can see a path to manifesting that uh, in a collaboration, that's a very, very nice place to start. Oftentimes we think about partnership and collaboration in terms of if I'm bringing X set of assets and this person's bringing X set of knowledge, the two of us can combine and it's a mathematical equation, it'll work out. I call BS on that. That never works. That never works. Uh, that's the, forgive me, that's the way international development organizations for years have dropped the ball by just looking at those types of things. There are so many intermediate points of collaboration to make a good working relationship, and you should approach them in the same way that you approach any kind of friendship or relationship that you're going to pursue. Would I enjoy working with this person? Do they inspire passion or interest in me? At a minimum, are they curious about what I'm working on? Or am I curious about what they're working on? I would highly encourage you to focus on that. Uh, the other thing that I would encourage is in the course of, of collaborations, in the course of bigger partnerships, coordinating multiple individuals, beware distractions. Um, that's why a framework like that MSpot framework, you could come up with a SWOT analysis, all sorts of different frameworks. So there's a useful tool to just bring you back, but having your mission be really core and thinking about partnerships and collaborations in the pursuit of that mission and whether they are a play that's important to this or whether there's something that can be omitted is a really useful framework, at least for myself, in thinking about grander partnerships. Because sometimes we pursue partnerships because this person has an incredible network. This person is incredibly cool. This organization has reach that I don't think I could have. Uh, but to what end, right? Uh, if if it's to uh, if if your pursuit is to gain more followers on Instagram, uh, and you think that person will will help you in that, go for it. Uh, but if your pursuit is to uh, plant uh, ten thousand pinga trees, and you meet somebody who has a bunch of followers on Instagram, I encourage you to think about how many leaps it will take for that person who will help you with followers on Instagram to actually lead to planting more impinga trees. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, collaboration's tough. Uh, also, more of you should be dating, just to be clear. Nice, interesting, interesting, interesting. So at this point, I would like to conclude the session. And guys, I really apologize for those who haven't had your questions answered. 
And, you know, to make up for that, I would like to invite Stephen. Maybe if you can give your final remarks as well as type your uh, contact details where people can reach and also where the people here can get their questions answered. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'm going to drop my LinkedIn in the chat because that's the easiest place to find me. Um, so I'll do that right now. All right. Final remarks. Um, thank you all so much for, for listening uh, and for your incredibly informed questions. Uh, if you do have more questions, please send them to me by LinkedIn. I did mention I have two small young children. So if I take a couple of days to get back to you, I apologize. I'm blaming them. Um, I I thought this was uh, an incredibly uh, an incredible incredible representation of all the um, endeavors that U.S. fellows are taking on here in MCN. I really encourage you to speak to each other as often as you can. Listening to folks like me is really important, but like the power that you learn from each other is what will inform the change. For someone like me, I spoke to my two small young children, like. I made the conscious decision to bring two children into the world in a world I'm worried about the climate, the future climate of, um, both on social issues and in climate change itself. You, your generation is my bulwark against that. And I believe in you, desperately believe in you. Um, and uh, and I think other folks like myself would encourage and be resources to to help you in the pursuit of these endeavors, um, to strive for a better future for us and to, uh, and, and for my, for my two beautiful young children. So I encourage you to continue, continue to work, to, to talk to each other. You are the best resources you have are each other. Um, and, uh, and if, and if you need advice from other folks or you need to collaborate with other folks, draw them in, but you have a great community here and wonderful leaders, campus leaders and, and folks here at the MCN. Thank you. Thanks for your time.